Thank you for joining us today. It's a great day to celebrate Jesus. I hope that your faith in him is growing as we go through this voluntary interment. Oh, so uh, let's pray. In fact, I'd really in, uh, like it if you would add to your prayers regularly. Uh, my brother Ken, who's uh, fighting um, COVID-19, dealing with that, is in the hospital and being watched carefully there. So thanks, thank God for the nurses and so on. Also, my, his wife Sandy is going through it on a much lighter case so pray for her too and then also going through it with him that would be a good thing if we can take some time for prayer like that let's bow for prayer <laughs> most gracious mighty god in heaven i thank you so much that you love us that you care for us that you know our needs that you know when a hair drops out of our head or the bird falls from the sky you are in control of everything and we thank you for that we Thank you for reminding us on a regular basis that you're in charge. No matter what happens in the world, you're in charge. And we appreciate that. So we surrender ourselves to you today. We pray that you would help us to live to glorify you. Our words, our, our lifestyle would glorify you in everything that we do and everything that we say. And Father, we pray that you would bless our time together. Uh, touch us by uh, the lesson that we might learn from the church at Sardis. And we thank you for um, this opportunity to be together and to celebrate Jesus. What a wonderful thing to do on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we're going through a little bit of struggles here and there, it's always good to remind us that our God is able to get through things. And so let's just sing that song, He is able, would you? He is able more than able to accomplish what concerns me today. He is able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. He is able, more than do much more than I could ever dream. He is able, more than able, to make me what he wants me to be. Can you join again now? He is able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. Anything that comes my way, he's able, more than able, to do much more than I could ever dream. He is able, more than able, to make me what he wants me to be. One more time, this time let's make it personal to God. You are able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. You are able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. You are able, more than able, much more than I could ever dream. You are able, more than able, to make me what you want me to be. Well, that should give us courage to face the days ahead, knowing that God is in charge. He is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, sovereign in all that he does. And he, the best of all, he's our loving father. So we, we're dealing with that. But today, let's talk about the church at, um, at Sardis. I called it the church of the living dead. Have you noticed how fascinated we are with the living dead? Um, 
movies all about uh, the let's see the the Living Dead, uh, Shaun of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Living Dead, uh, Lincoln and, uh, and the Vampire Killer, vampire stories all over the place. We just love the idea of the Living Dead. Well, this is a church back in the. 9080, first century, John was writing about a church that was the living dead. Let's uh, read it, then we'll go back through it a little bit, okay? So it's in Revelation, the third chapter, the first six verses. Revelation 3, 1 through 6. The name of the church is Sardis, so we'll call it the Sardis Christian Church, okay? To the angel of the church at Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits. Remember the seven spirits are actually the complete spirit or the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And who are the seven stars? That would be the preachers of each one of the churches. <clears throat> I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few in people in Sardis who have not soiled their cloths, their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so we're talking about the church that is living dead, okay? And what we see about this church, well, Sardis is a very rich town. It's in a, in a beautiful, fertile valley of um, rich soil, so it had wonderful um, vineyards, and people were all rich living there. And, and uh, the, the wonderful thing, it was famous all throughout the Roman Empire anyway, because it had, it was, there was a, a part of the town was down, down in the bottom, down in the valley, and then there was this huge uh, cliff, and on top of the cliff, there was more of the town. In fact, the town started up there, and as it grew, it dropped down to, the, to the, this cliff, and it was known as a citadel because it was uh, a, a natural protection. No one could conquer it. They felt very con um, confident in that. A couple times, people did con uh, did uh, conquer it because they lost their, uh, the people at the top lost their attention and did not watch the people climbing up the, the cliff and amassing at the top to, to attack the town. So a couple times in its history, it did, back before Christ came, it did have that trouble. But it was known as a, as a great place to, be, to find protection. Uh, and the church there at Sardis was one we don't know again. It's not. It's one we don't know who started it or how it started. But the the guess is that it might have started from some of the area churches, might maybe Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, or even Thyatira. Uh, it might be people from there were at the day of Pentecost when the church started, and there were those three thousand people who accepted the Lord and were identified with Him in the watery grave of baptism. And then as they went back home, they started their churches in these areas. And we don't know. We, the only one we know about that started was, uh, we know um, Ephesus started with Paul, right? Paul was there and started it. So um, these others we don't really know. We're guessing. Uh, so that's it. But what we find out about this church is that it has a whole lot of programs, he says, I know your deeds. You have a lot of deeds, but, you have, uh, but you're dead. 
all these programs. It's kind of a club church, you know. They have, they have a big youth program, and they bring the kids in, and they play their uh, games, and they, uh, they, they might have a great game room that they all go to, and and not a whole lot of Bible teaching there, but a lot of gathering and camaraderie, probably. Uh, the enthusiasm, oh, and then every Easter Sunday, you know, they have this grand choir. They've all gathered together and they sing the Handel's Messiah and everybody in the churches gets to sing it with the choir. And it's just a glorious time. And they're just an amazing church with all these activities, a woman's club and the men's get uh, Bible studies and uh jazzercise of all kinds going on there and helping this world up. Then there's, so people are saying, yeah, I belong to the Christian church of Sardis. Whoa, Christian church. Yeah, we've heard so much about it. It's famous all over the place. It's an amazing church. But everything that it is was kind of like lipstick on a corpse. You know, it makes it look alive, but it isn't alive. See, the reason it isn't alive is because there's a problem with purpose. So let's read a couple of these. Let's read these verses and see that. Okay, back up to the first verse. To the angel of the church of uh, Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven, and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent, but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what t at what time I will come to you. So the problem is, it was doing all these things, all these act, um, all these uh, programs and activities, uh, for the accolades. They weren't doing it for Jesus; they were doing it for the accolades. It the church was making churchians, not Christians. There weren't people who were deeply devoted to Jesus. It was a, a, a big city. It had a huge. It had a. a thousand-member synagogue in it, okay? Jews, uh, large Jewish contingency or congregation there. And it had a huge, the Acropolis was there, right? Worshiping uh, uh, the Greek gods of the, Ac the Acropolis. And of course, there was all that empire worship, which uh, or emperor worship that we uh, talk about. And so all these things maybe were in competition. And so they thought of, they started thinking of the way that they would reach people is not by preaching the gospel and living the gospel out, but by doing all these wonderful and glorious things. Maybe wowing God from here on earth. Look how great we are, God. Look at all the things we do. Look at all the, the activities we do. So if we have a church that's just full of activities, but no message of the gospel, no preaching about Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, and why he had to go through it, there is no, he says, got to remember, guys, what this is all about. It's not about the grandeur of gathering as a church. It's about the grandeur of, the, of God who loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. You're missing the message. They had forgotten it. They had forgotten that Jesus died, suffered and died uh, to wash away our sins. He came because he hated sin so much. He wanted to destroy the power of sin that was destroying his beautiful world that he had created. And so that's why he came, and that's why we exist as Christians. The message is so important to grab a hold of. And we want to study the word and ground ourselves in the word and every activity. I'm not saying activities are bad. He's not saying activities are bad. What he's just saying is you forgot why you're being active. You forgot what it's all about. You forgot that I am the focus, not you and what wonderful things you can plan, what wonderful things you can do, but it's about what wonderful thing I have done 
for you and for the entire world, for whosoever will. Whoever hears the message and comes to me. Now, I want to make a point about that, and that is that every one of these churches we've studied so far are dealing with a lot of hassle and hardship, right? We've talked about the persecution they're going through and the struggles they're going through, hardship that they face. And each one of them have, finds a different way to handle that hardship. The first one, Ephesus, dealt with uh, the fact that um, they just really held on to the word and the truth of the word, but they forgot to be loving and caring and gracious to others. They seemed like just a, a, a snobby bunch of Bible quoters, and that was it. The next church was a humble church, a quiet church, and just endured the hardship, and, and God just loved that, seeing that. The third one, Pergamus, um, Pergamum, well, was a good church, and it was very outreaching, but it didn't really hold on to the truth much and let everybody come in. Thought, maybe if I deal with this, I don't have to worry about people attacking us and coming and putting us down. And the fourth one that we looked last week was about they, they had increasing knowledge and increasing outreach and increasing love, but they too were caught up in a world of well, let's just go along to get along. Let's tolerate everything. Let's not condemn anything. Let's uh, allow these people to do whatever they want to. That doesn't work either. Christians need to hold tight to the doctrines, to the, to the word of God, understanding that God breathed every one, all, every word in here. He brought it to us. And that if that causes us to suffer, because we're standing pure, we're holding on, that is the important thing. We don't have to try to find ways to get along in this world. We have to get along with the word and allow the world to get along with us. That's the idea. So then he goes into the fourth, uh, fourth through the sixth verses. He says, Yet you have a few people in Sardis, who've not soiled their clothes. They haven't got caught up in the world. They haven't got caught up in all these wonderful little programs. They come to church because it's the body of Christ. They come to church because it's the family of God. <sighs> Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white. What's the white about? Purity, right? Walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. So, victorious, overcoming all this other stuff. I will never blot out the name of um, blot out the name of that person from the book of life. The book of life is the last book opened up, and you'll read about it in in chapters nineteen, twenty, and twenty two of uh, Revelation 21, 22, 19, 20, 21, 22, dealing with the book of life and how it was actually started. I mean, it actually uh, was first mentioned back in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, the 32nd verse of the 32nd chapter. And that it was actually written out that everybody in that book of life was already in it before the world was created. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that fill you with awe knowing that God looked down through the history and saw your name there? He says, but don't, I won't, I, I, I be careful, stick with this or your name's blotted out. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Remember that? while Jesus was talking about uh, witnessing, and he says, if you testify about me before men, I will testify about you before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever has ears, let, uh, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, the last idea is that the, the, there are a plethora, of pro, a plethora of programs in this church, but that's not what God is looking for. Because he's looking for programs with a purpose. The whole reason we do anything that we do is to draw people in. The whole reason we hold Sunday morning worship service is to draw people into us. It's a great evangelistic outreach if you would bring your friends in 
and we would teach the word courageously and hold on to it and, and practice love and grace while you bring in your friends. It's a good place to do that. But everything else that we do, our Halloween uh, night where we give away candy and, and bring kids in, that's to bring families into the church. The outreach that we go knocking on doors and see uh, visiting people, that's to bring families into the church, not just to have a busy thing to do. If we have... Um, you know, jazzercise in the fellowship hall, which might blow some people's minds. What are you doing allowing that stuff in the church? If that is there, then we also need to couple it with some Bible study, some devotion, some reason for other than just opening the door to let people in. Everything we do has to have the purpose, and the purpose is the Word of God. So there's a promise of purity at the end. Everything we do needs to be led by the Holy Spirit. Right? That's what he said. Everything we need to do, every, every potluck we have, every outreach we do, needs to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need to pray about it and ask him to help us with it. Help, help, ask him to help us not just be doing it because we should do something. Not just be busy, but to do God's business. And he says uh, the, he will walk in, in white robes with us because we're walking with Jesus. Jesus is pure. He loves purity. And he wants us to be pure. Now, the idea that Christians just can't be pure isn't totally true. We, Paul mentions in Romans, the sixth chapter, that we have died to sin. We can't live in it. We can't splash around in it. We can't uh, mess around with it and, and uh, dally in it at all. And it's like that little story of the kid who um, mom just made a beautiful batch of of uh, chocolate chip cookies. And she puts it all, cooled it down, puts it into the cookie jar, and she says, no, this is not for now. This is after we eat supper. So don't mess around with it. And so she leaves the kitchen, and all of a sudden she hears the little lid on the cookie jar lift up, you know. And she hear, uh, hears it being set down, and she says, what are you doing, Joey? And he says, My hand is resisting temptation. No. How you resist temptation is not to be in the area there for, like Joseph running out of the house when Potiphar's wife was throwing herself at him. Get out of there. Don't dally around it at all. We don't want to mess with that. We're walking with Jesus. And we're holding to holiness. There's nothing wrong with being holy. The world makes fun of us because we are. They call us goody two-shoes. They, they ridicule us for our commitment to the truth. But God wants us to be holy. He loves holiness. He made the world to be holy. And it's suffering the curse of sin because we are sinners. Jesus died for us. So we should live for him every day. And if that living means dying, then that's what we do. And we do it bravely. If it means making it through COVID. <coughs> excuse me. No, that's not a COVID cough. I just swallowed wrong. Um, if we make it through COVID, we do it bravely and courageously. We encourage others. We smile when we see people. We talk to them. We talk to them farther than six feet apart, you know, so that we don't give them uh, the, a fear of anything. So that's what we do. We're compassionate. We're loving. We're patient. We're kind. All the way through. We don't let things shake us because we know he is able, more than able, 
to handle what confronts each one of our days. Don't let this COVID shake us. Don't let the world attacking your faith in Jesus shake you. Stand up strong for it. We aren't the church of the living dead. We're the church of the dead living. We have died to sin. We now live with him forever. That's the plan. That's the heart. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, I thank you so much for the promise of Jesus, for the joy we can have in Jesus, for the strength we can have in, in uh, loving and expressing our love for Jesus, for the peace we can have that passes all understanding and help us to live that life. Help us not to be the church of the living dead, but the church of the dead living for Jesus in all that we do. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. We have, again, this reminder that we do every week. And the reason we do it every week is because we need this reminder. We need to be reminded that Jesus died for our sins. That he was buried and that he rose again. And so this, these, this little piece of bread, and this little tiny sip of, of uh, grape juice helps us to remember that Jesus gave up his body, hung it on, allowed it to be hung on the cross, voluntarily allowed it to be hung on the cross so that your sins and mine might be punished for. Taking our punishment that is due us, we should all just die and go to hell. But he made a way for it and he says, I'm reminding you, I want you to take this and remember what I've done for you every day so that it helps you throughout Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday so that you can make it to next Sunday to be reminded again what we need to hate and what we need to love. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it blessed it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat all of it. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. The old done is done away with. Now we have the new covenant, the covenant that we need more, no more sacrifices. We need nothing else than the blood of Jesus. And so he said, this is my blood shed for the sins of many. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So thank you for coming and, and sharing this bit of a, a service with us today for joining our short service. Don't forget that our uh, expenses continue. We need your tithes and offerings. We love the first responders in our community and appreciate them. We love our medical professional on the front, the professionals on the front line in this battle. Oh my goodness. And we're happy with the news that uh, a vaccine may be out before the end of the year that we can all take and, and uh, be back to normal, hopefully in, a, in not too many more weeks and months ahead. We want to also see um, our truckers and our delivery people are so important to this battle for us and all of the other essential workers that we need to celebrate. Thank you all so much for that. And as Paul says to the Ephesians, grace to all who live, who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. We'll see you next week. God bless.